Hey everyone, it's Colt. Today we're talking about the box model in CSS, one of the most essential concepts in understanding CSS and being able to build layouts and make things look the way you want them to look. This video is part of a series I'm doing on CSS and a bigger series I'm doing on coding in general, but you can also just jump in and learn the box model. I've tried to make it modular. So we've got a lot to talk about. I'm pretty happy with how this video turned out. Um, we start with the basics, so we'll cover things like border, padding, margin, shorthand, and longhand. And then we talk about some other properties like box sizing and border clipping. So for some of you who already know the basics, you may not know those two properties. Then we're gonna focus more on the display property and how it interacts with or changes the behavior of the box model. Specifically, we'll talk about block, inline, and inline block and compare the three. And then I'll wrap up with a pretty good homework assignment. I think it's a good one. Um, it has some challenging pieces. So look forward to that if you look forward to things like that. And before we get started, if you would consider sharing this video and this whole series I'm doing with anyone who's interested in coding or just sharing it in general, yelling about it to the world, I really appreciate it. Now let's get going. Here's a box model. Every element in CSS has a box around it. Whether you see it or not, there's a box. Whether you're working with heading elements like an H1, a button, paragraphs, anchor tags, images, list items, they all have boxes around them. And being able to understand how these boxes work, that's really important, but also being able to understand and use the properties to manipulate the boxes to make them bigger or smaller or change the spacing, that is all crucial if you wanna create layouts nice looking or not you just want to create layouts uh, and move content around and all that stuff hinges around the box model so there are these boxes around every single element and each box really consists of a couple different pieces there are different properties that we can manipulate and we're going to start by focusing on this inner box this purpley i don't know what color that is a light lilac color that I'm calling the content box. I don't, I don't know why I said I'm calling it. That's what it's called, the content box. And then we have padding and border and margin. We will come back to those, but let's start with the content box. So in any element, let's take uh, an H1. So here I've got a code pen, very simple. I have some massive images, we'll come back to that. But I have an H1 up top. If I give all H1s a background color, background color of uh, lavender. Okay, we can see that there is a lavender box taking up the entire line. Now, an H1 is a block level element. We'll actually be talking more about block and inline and inline block elements because that is an important piece of the box model. But for now, all that you need to know about block level elements, if you're not familiar, is that their box, the content box, goes all the way across the line takes up all that space by default. But I can change the width and the height using two properties, width and height. These are how we manipulate the inner content box, how I change the size of this stuff, the purpley stuff that you're seeing, or the lavender stuff. So I could change the width to be, let's see, maybe 500 pixels. Let's see if that's, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit less. How about 350 pixels? Sure. And I can manipulate the height. How about uh, 150 pixels? Well, that's kind of massive, so maybe not. But I'll just show you that we can set the height as well. All right. So that is changing the inner content box itself. And I can do the same thing for these massive images using width and height. And when we work with width and height, we have a couple different units. Well, more than a couple that we can use. I'm using pixels right now just to keep it simple. You can also use M's and percentages. There are other properties or special values like auto and inherit. I'll be talking more about units in CSS in a separate video. Things like M's and root M's, percentages, uh, VH's, VW's. I'll have a separate video on that. So to keep this simple, I'll be using pixels. Okay, so we have width and height. We can set a pixel dimension for that inner content box. So let's do that for the three massive images I have here. These are each from unsplash.com. They are cute little animals. And I will set a width about uh, 300 pixels and a height of 200 pixels. Okay, so there are my three images. And what we're seeing here, there isn't a background color like we have on the H1, 
but we're seeing that inner content box showing up as the actual image itself. But then we have these other properties. And we're going to begin with border. Border is pretty self-explanatory. It is the border around each box here. And there are many different ways of setting a border. Um, let's work with the H1 first. I can do it all in one line with a shorthand property where I can set a width of the border and then a style like a solid border and then a color like purple. Okay, so that's my border there. I can also change the width, of course, make it uh, 10 pixels, super chunky there. Let's go back to two. Not that either of them looks very good. I'll do the same thing for my images. I'll give them a border of two pixels. Uh, how about dashed magenta? It's gonna be really ugly. Oof, yeah, I regret that already. Let's go with black. So that's the shorthand version of setting border, where we do it in one line. But we also have a whole bunch of separate properties we can set to change the color or the style or the width of each border, top, bottom, left, and right. So let's play around with the H1. I could instead do, I could start with this and make everything purple, and then say border top color is actually cyan. And there we go, it becomes cyan. Uh, I could do, I guess I'll just do this border right color. How about magenta? And then border bottom color, um, yellow. And then border bottom or border left color, maybe just magenta again. So we can do that where we set each border as a separate color. And I can do the same thing to give them a separate thickness. I won't do this for all of them. Let's do border uh, bottom. Is it width? I think I can never remember this. We'll go with five pixels for the width. And it does get thicker there. And then we also can change the style on one of them. How about border top style? We'll make it uh, dotted. And there we go. Hopefully that's showing up on the screencast. It is a dotted border. So there are lots of different ways of setting the border, but most of the time I'm just doing this, setting a border on all four sides and one thickness, consistent one color. But if you ever need to call out a separate color or a separate width or a separate style, you absolutely can. And there's also, I guess, what you would call a medium hand where I can set the style for all uh, four sides at once or set the color for all four sides or the thickness or the width just like this border, uh, what should I do? Let's do border color and set that to be teal. You'll see that it, it leaves everything else intact, the thickness and the style, but it does set the color on all four. So we have the similar idea, but for style and for width, you can set all four sides at once, each side individually, or set everything at once, assuming that you have the same thickness and color and style for all four sides. Okay, so that's border, the, the border <laughs> around our element. But this diagram looks a little bit different than what we've seen so far. This diagram shows spacing between the content box and the border. In both of these examples, the content in this one is an image, and it goes right up to the border. And then here, the content box is that uh, lilac -y or lavender color background. It goes right up to the border as well. But that's because by default, this padding property, that's the name of the spacing between the content box and the border box, that padding property is set to zero, at least for these elements. So just like with border, where we have a shorthand property and then we have a bunch of long form properties, we have a similar approach with padding. Padding itself is not something that we add a color to, uh, but we do specify or we can specify padding on the top, the bottom, the left, the right, or all four sides at once, or two sides, top and bottom, left and right. But I'm just gonna show you the shorthand to begin with. So padding is going to accept a value of a certain number of pixels or Ms or some unit of percentage. We're gonna focus on pixels just like we did with border to keep it simple. So I'm gonna set padding on all sides, how about 20 pixels? Now watch the images here. You can see now that there is space between the content box and the border. That is the padding. So if I set that to you know 50 pixels, we get a lot more space there. 
Let's go back to 20. If we open up the Chrome DevTools here, go to the Elements tab, select our little inspector, whatever this arrow is called, and we hover over one of these images. What we see right there, it's kind of hard to tell, uh, but there's a blue box, a blue highlight over the content box itself. And then green is indicating the padding. And then there's a very slight yellow over the border. I don't know if that's going to show up in the screencast very well. But the dev tools are showing me, they're highlighting the content, the padding, and the border. If I do it on the H1, there is no padding to look at. It's just the content is that blue box. We have an added padding. And then the border is, you know, the four different sides. And we haven't talked about margin, but that orange stuff is margin. Another way that we can explore the box model in the Chrome DevTools is by clicking on one of the elements, selecting it over here, or clicking this arrow and selecting it over here, and then looking at this little section here. This allows us to view the content. First of all, I can hover over the content. It highlights it. Hover over the padding. It highlights that. Let's do a different image that is not so green. All right, this one's a little bit easier to see. So there is the content in blue, the padding in green, and the border in yellow. Hopefully that shows up. I can also tweak them on here um, and play around with it. So if I wanted to add more padding, I don't know, on the right-hand side, I can type a number in, about 40 pixels, and hit Enter. And now that change is reflected here. It's just temporary. As soon as I refresh the page, it's going to disappear. Okay, so those dev tools can be very useful. That is the basic idea of padding. It's that space between the content box and the border. So this padding property that we've been looking at so far on the images, we pass in a single value. It, it applies 20 pixels of padding to all four edges or all four sides of that content box. We also can specify individual pieces like padding top, padding right, padding bottom. Um, so I could do you know 20 pixels on all sides. And then on the bottom, I want uh, 40 pixels. And there we go. We get 40 pixels on the bottom, 20, 20, and 20. I also could use uh, a different version or a different value for this padding property. We can pass in one value, which will be applied to all sides. I can pass in two, which will apply the first one to the vertical, so top and bottom padding, and then the second value to left and right. So I'll show that here. Let's comment you out and do padding. How about something really obvious like uh, 10 pixels? No, how about 40 pixels top and bottom and 10 pixels left and right? So that first value, if there's only two of them, the first one is top and bottom. The second one is left and right. If we pass in one value, it's all four sides. There is a shorthand for uh, three of them. I pretty much never use this because it's kind of confusing to remember which one is which. Apparently, if you pass in three, first value is for the top padding, the last value is for bottom padding, and the middle value is for left and right together. But this is pretty common to see four. Top, right, bottom, left. That order is important. It's a clockwise order, right? The top, then the right, then the bottom, then the left. This is pretty common to use. So I'll show that. Let's do, uh, what should we do here? Padding top will be 10 pixels and then 20 pixels for the right, 30 pixels for the bottom, and 40 pixels for the left. Okay, so 10, 20, 30, and 40. Another thing that you'll see is padding zero, which is just a way of saying no padding. For example, if I add in a button here and uh, this button just says hi, it's an inline element. Let me make it a bit larger or all buttons a little bit larger. I'll give it a uh, font size of 40 pixels. Okay, so if you look at this button here, I'll give it a border, how about uh, two pixels solid magenta. That's the border there. And if we look at it in the Chrome DevTools, you would see, I won't even bother doing it, you would see that there is a little bit of default padding. I can remove that with just padding zero on all sides. Now we have no padding. So that is something that you may want to do, maybe not for a button, but certain elements by default will have some, usually not a whole lot, but some padding. Remove it with padding zero. So to summarize that, we have padding left, top, right, and bottom as separate individual properties that we can set. We also have the more commonly used padding shorthand, which accepts a single value, two values, three values, or four values.
And just remember, if you pass in four, it's a clockwise, so top, right, bottom, and then left. That is the order. So that is padding, the space between the content box and the border. And that leads us to the final piece here, which is margin. So margin is the empty space between the border or the outside of one box or one element and other elements on the page. So it's empty space. It is kind of like the force field around an element that we can control. We can do it on all four sides. We can have left margin, right margin, uh, no margin. And just like with padding, we have a shorthand margin property and we also have margin top, margin left, margin right, and margin bottom. So here's the docs on MDN for margin. Most commonly I use the margin shorthand property just like with padding. We can provide one value, two, three, or four values, or we can just set it to zero, which is the same thing, it's just one value. We also uh, have separate margin top, margin right, margin bottom, and margin left. So back here in my code pen, let's add margin to our images. And I'll start with just setting margin on everything, on all four sides to be 20 pixels. And there we go, you can see that they space out 20 pixels in between. Now, if we actually inspect with the Chrome DevTools, let's take a look at one of them. You can see that margin being highlighted in orange. So this right here is 40 pixels in between. I can't really highlight it because uh, I'm just going to switch over to the left one. But if you add up 20 pixels and 20 pixels, we get 40 pixels of space between those images. And then over here, we've got 20 pixels on the left hand side. So if I bring this open it up again a little bit further come on here we go where we have this inspector I can see content box on let's take uh, which one of these images how about the middle image here which is this tiger image okay so we've got our content which is 300 pixels by 200 pixels then we have padding of 20 pixels on all sides then we have our border which is two pixels wide then we have 20 pixels of margin on all sides so we end up with 40 pixels between the two vertically, at least when they're stacking right now. And then if we close that down, 40 pixels between the two here. So margin acts as that force field or the space around an element. And we can set margin specifically on one side or two or three or four sides individually. Let's take the H1 and set margin bottom to be 100 pixels. And you'll see that we have a lot more space now. Um, I could do that, you know, 300 pixels, and then I could set margin left, left to be 100 pixels, and you'll see that it shifts over 100 pixels. So from that pink thing, the edge of that border to over here is 100 pixels. Now, I think there's actually a little bit of margin on the body by default. Let's see, can you see that right there? I think that's the body, there's some orange we can reset that on the body and uh, there's it's pretty common to use CSS reset style sheets because certain browsers have different styles that are default so if I set margin zero on the body this should shift over a tiny bit and it does okay so that just removes all margin on all four sides let's see what else is there uh, we have margin top bottom left and right we also have that same shorthand syntax where I can set I'm probably gonna comment this out because it's so ugly not that anything is attractive on this page but I'll comment it out we also can pass in two values to margin so I could do 20 pixels vertically so top and bottom and then uh, how about 10 pixels left and right so we can't really see the top and bottom margin very clearly but here we have 20 pixels of total space 10 pixels from each one 10 from the left of the turtle 10 from the right of mr. tiger I also can do all four so it's top, right, left, and then bottom. Um, what will be easiest? I think what might actually be easiest is if I call one of these images out. How about this middle one? I'll give it uh, an ID of, what should we do? How about tiger? And then I will remove margin from the others. Select tiger. And then set margin to be, how about uh, 10 pixels on the top? We'll do the same thing, 20 on the right, maybe 30 on the bottom, and 40 on the left. Okay, so we've got 10 pixels of margin up top, we've got 20 on the right, 30 on the bottom, and then 40 on the left.
So it ends up sort of shifting upwards because of that bottom margin. There's nothing below. Um, but if I did have content below or if I shrink this down, let's see, open up the dev tools just to shrink the window a bit. You can see that margin a little bit clearer here. So small margin up top, slightly bigger on the right, more on the bottom and the most margin on the left. So that is margin. Um, again, there are other units you can use, M's, percentages. I'm not going to go into that here because uh, I'd like to do a separate video on units in general. It's kind of a complicated topic in CSS. So pixels for now works just fine. So we have padding and margin that both have a shorthand version that takes one, two, three, or four different values. We also have individual padding top, left, right, bottom, and margin top, left, right, bottom. Padding is the space between the content box and the border. Margin is the force field or the space outside the border between one element and any other elements. So that's the basics of the box model. So now what I'd like to do is talk about some box model adjacent or relevant uh, properties that aren't margin, padding, and border, but that come into play and may be useful. So the first one I'd like to show you is something called box sizing. Box sizing allows us to change how the width and height properties are calculated or, or basically how they work for a given box. So I'm gonna demonstrate a scenario first. Um, I'm gonna have a selector for all images when you hover over them. Let's add a, a bigger border. So we've got a two pixel dashed black border. Let's do a border of five pixels solid. Uh, what's a color I like? How about Rebecca purple? Let's see how that looks. Okay, so I'm hovering, we get that purple border. But do you see how everything is shifting around? What's happening here is that we're setting the width of our content to be 200 by 300 pixels, the image itself. And then everything else is added on top of that. So when I have a two pixel border, which is what we have right now, until I hover, that grows to a five pixel border. And that's gonna shift everything else because we have that margin between our elements and that margin is not changing. It's going to stay 20 pixels or whatever we set it to. Uh, so when the border grows, everything shifts around. But using this property, box sizing, we can change how width and height are calculated. Instead of width and height, setting the width and the height of the content box, I can set box sizing to a value called border box, which tells CSS that I want the width and height to be the entire content box plus the padding up until the border. So if I set a width of 200 pixels, I want that to go from one border to the other side not just the content box. And that allows me to adjust the padding or adjust the thickness of a border without changing the size of the overall box. So I'll show you that here. Let's set box sizing on all images to be border box. And you'll see that things shrink down. So this is now 200 by 300 pixels and you can see already it's working. But the 200 by 300 is this entire box, including the border and the padding and the content. This can be useful, not just for hover effects. It can be useful in general if you're just trying to make something some size, you know that you need your image to be exactly this size or your, your div or whatever it is, 500 by 500 pixels. You can add padding and change padding and change border thickness and all of that without actually impacting the dimensions of the overall box. So that's box sizing. The default value for box sizing is content box. So if you needed to selectively undo this or just go back to the default, it's content dash box. And now that 200 by 300 pixels that I set for width and height is just this image on the inside, the content box itself. So as I hover, that border grows, everything shifts around. So I'm gonna go back to border box. Okay, so that's the first property that I want to talk about. It's box model relevant. Next up, I'd like to show another property called background clip. This allows us to uh, decide where the background of our content actually is, or if in a given box. Is the background around the content box? Does it go to the edge of the border, or does it go all the way around the border, or to the outside of the border? So I've added in three buttons at the bottom here inside of a div, just so I can style them differently from this one button that I sent, or that I set padding to be zero on. And um, how do I wanna do this here? Do I wanna use an ID to style each one separately? 
Hmm. Well, what I'm going to start with is by giving them all a background color. So every button inside of a div, which is just those three at the moment, I'll give them a background color of, how about olive? Okay, so there's that color. Let's give them a slightly more attractive border. How about border will be two pixel solid. Well, I don't know if this is attractive, but eh, maybe it goes a little bit better. So I've got the olive background, and if I add in some padding to all of those buttons, how about a padding of uh, 20 pixels on all sides? Sure. And I'm going to make the border also dashed so that we can see exactly where that content goes to. And I'm also going to make it more like five pixels. We're not going for beauty here. All right, so you can see that the background right now, I've set to olive, extends all the way to the outside edge of that border. But we have a couple options for how we control that background clip. So I'm going to select the first button in there, div button. And uh, it's a bit clunky, but I guess I'll do nth of type. So we'll take that first button and we'll give it a background clip of content dash box. And that is one of the options. There are three options I'll show you. Content dash box tells CSS or tells the browser, I want the background only to extend around the inner content box. So not the padding, don't go up to the border, just stop at that content box. Now I'm just gonna duplicate this and go for the second button in that div. And I'm not gonna do content box, I'm going to do padding box. Padding box will extend to the edge of the padding but not to the edge of the border or the outer edge of the border, which as you probably have guessed by now, if we use uh, border dash box, that background extends all the way to the outside of the border. Border box is the default. So there are three different options. Now there's also a fourth option, which is newer. It's still classified as experimental, I believe on the MDN, is it? Yes. That little flask usually indicates experimental, where we can contain the background or clip it so that it's only painted within the text of an element. So this means that we can achieve effects like this, where the text itself is not colored. It's actually a transparent color for the text. It's not black or red or anything like this text. And there's a background, but the background is only uh, showing where that text is. It's clipped to the text. So you can do this with an image, you can do this with a gradient. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot around gradients or images as backgrounds right now, but there's a, a website I like called UI Gradients. I'm just gonna copy one of these gradients, maybe this one here. If I hit enter, it gives me the code to copy this gradient. So I'm just gonna copy that right there. So I'll add in, um, instead of a button, I think I'll do this on an H2 and I'll do something like, ooh, look at me. All right, so there's my H2. And I'm going to select that H2 and I'm going to set the background to be this gradient that I copied from that website, since we're not really talking about how gradients work right now, but you can generally, at least for this example, see how it works. You specify a direction, so it's a gradient to the right. And then we have three different colors. There's a lot more to gradients. I'll do a separate video on it one day. We have radial gradients, repeating gradients. Uh, you can set different proportions and there's a lot to them anyway. My text right now is black. I'm going to set the background clip to be text. However, this is not going to work in Chrome. If we go back to MDN and I scroll down, you'll see in Chrome, it supports most things, but it does not support text fully. We get yellow, which means partial support. And it says this value is supported with a prefixed version of the property only. So what we need to do is set this to be webkit dash background clip. This is something that um, I haven't actually talked about in this course so far. I'll do another video on prefixes and browsers and all of that, but this is just how we can get this property to work in Chrome. These prefixes are browser specific or technically they are browser engine specific. Anyway. It doesn't really matter. I just wanted to demonstrate this because it's kind of fun. If I set the text color to now be transparent, color transparent, you can see that gradient there. Although we're not getting the full gradient because of that background 
extending all the way over here. So why don't I set the width of my element to be maybe 200 pixels. Now that was too small. How about 300 pixels? And now we get that cool gradient effect. Let's also uh, maybe make the font size a bit larger. Font size, maybe 50 pixels. Okay, there we go. We now have another way, a different option of clipping the background. It's kind of a, an experiment, but it's fun to see. And this can be cool to have gradient text, not with this font, definitely not. But it is pretty trendy these days to have a gradient text or a piece of text, usually a heading. So that is another one of those properties adjacent to the box model background clip. Now what I'd like to end with is talking about the difference between inline and block level elements in regards to the block, the box model, as well as a third option for display, which is inline block. So I've made a new code pen just to help me explain this without a bunch of other stuff going on. And I've got uh, a section, which I don't really need for this example, but I've got an H1 inside, a button, and a paragraph. And that paragraph has a bunch of lorem ipsum text, and it has a span inside as well. So every single element in CSS is going to have some value set by default for its display property. For example, things like H1s are all headings and paragraph elements are block level elements. So if I give uh, the H1 a background color of pink, we see that it extends all the way across this line. So that box by default is going to fill the space available in its container, which is this entire block all the way across. Basically goes as wide as the container. It also means that it forces content onto a new line. So this button here is not sharing the space. <laughs> it gets shoved down to its own uh, area after this block level element. But I can change that display on my H1. I could say display is inline, which now makes it inline, just like a button. By default, a button is an inline element. So the box surrounding a inline element does not break onto a new line which uh, we probably already know by now. But in terms of the box model, there are some significant differences between inline and block. So with my H1, it has display of block by default. I could just put that here just to be clearer. I can set things like height. I'll make it uh, 200 or 100 pixels tall, and it works. The H1, the content height is increasing to 100 pixels. But if I make this an inline element, it's not respecting it. It doesn't care about that height. That's how inline elements work. Inline elements do not listen to the height or the width that we set. I can set width to be 200 or how about something like 400 pixels. It doesn't matter. I could set it to 4,000 pixels. It's not being respected. So that is how inline elements work. If we take a look at this span down here, and let's give it a different color to make it stand out a bit. How about color of magenta? There's the span. I'm going to give it a border, about two pixels, solid cyan. Okay, so there is the span right there. Spans are inline elements. If I set display to be block, it's gonna take up its own block all the way across. Okay, but let's go back. If I set a width to my span of 300 pixels, it's ignored because it is an inline element. But I still can do things like padding. I can set padding to be 20 pixels or how about 10 pixels to start. That is respected, right? We do end up with the left and right padding and the top and bottom padding, the space between the content and the border. But if you notice what's happening here, it's just overlapping the rest of the paragraph the rest of the content that would be there. It's not forcing stuff uh, to move around, if that makes sense. Nothing is being pushed down. This text just continues on its way. If I did some margin on all sides, margin of 10 pixels, we end up with spacing on the left and right as well. Let's do something more extreme. How about 30 pixels? So we end up with margin left and right and top and bottom, but it just doesn't do anything on the bottom here or on the top for that matter. So that's because it's an inline element. Uh, on an inline element, the box model behaves slightly differently. It makes sense if you want something to be inline, like in the middle of some text, if you set margin, if you set padding, you don't want your whole flow to be screwed up uh, and for all of this text to move around or to have a bunch of empty space right there. So that's how inline elements work. 
compared to block level elements, I'll go back to making that block, or I'll just remove, nah, I'll just keep it there, keep it block. We can add padding, margin, whatever we want, right? I can do margin bottom of 200 pixels, and that is respected. Everything moves down. Then there's a third option, which is kind of in between, called inline block. If I take this span and I set display to be inline block, display inline dash block, notice what happens now. It doesn't take up its own line, so it doesn't fully act like a block level element. It's closer to an inline element in that sense, but it does respect the width, the height, the margin on all sides, the padding on all sides, and the content is going to move around it based off of the margin in this case. Um, so I can give it a height or a width, an explicit width, like uh, 500 pixels, which will be quite large, and that actually works. If I had set it to inline, that is ignored because it's an inline element. Inline block is basically a hybrid, it's a combination. So it, it acts like a block level element in pretty much every way, except for the fact that it doesn't take up an entire block or an entire line of content. It doesn't force things onto a separate line. So inline block can be useful um, if you have elements that, you know, you want them to share space and be inline, but you also want to be able to control their margin and their padding. Um, or if you have something like a link or a button or a span where you need to explicitly set the width or the margin or the padding and have it be respected, you can use inline block. Just a quick note, display is a relatively complicated property. Everything we've been discussing is known as the outer display. So it dictates how an element uh, behaves, the display, if it's inline block or inline dash block. Outside the element, there's another option, which is inner display, uh, which controls how the element behaves inside. We're not gonna talk about that now. I'm gonna cover Flexbox later on in a separate video, uh, and we'll see more about display. But for now, the three options we're covering or that we just covered are inline, block, and inline block. All three of them behave slightly differently with regards to the box model. Well, it's not even slightly. The difference between inline and block is pretty substantial when it comes to setting a width or a height, having your margin respected on all sides. Inline block behaves mostly like a block level element, except our element does not take up its own line or it doesn't force content onto a new line afterwards. Lastly, there is a homework assignment or a exercise activity, do it yourself at home project, whatever you wanna call it, there's an assignment. Uh, you can find the link in the description to all of the code from today, as well as the homework and the homework solution. So what I'm showing you right now is the homework solution. Um, I know it's not very beautiful, but it does combine a lot of what we discussed today. So what you'll see if you open up the actual exercise, not the solution, is this right here. I'm giving you the HTML markup, and uh, I'm giving you some comments in the CSS, but that's it. And if you look at the actual content being rendered, we've got a couple images that are massive, and then we've got up top uh, what is going to be a nav bar, some links, and then at the bottom, a form with a username and a password field and a button. So your job is to create this layout and uh, some of the behavior, the spacing, the padding, the margin, all of that stuff, that you can see in the solution. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about getting pixel perfect down to you know exactly 20 pixels or 30 pixels in between these two. I would just try and recreate it in general. You know, if you if you can get margin or padding where there needs to be margin or padding, it doesn't really matter how much is there. That's just a matter of changing a single number. So don't drive yourself crazy trying to recreate it perfectly. Let's step through each piece. The nav bar here obviously is very different. So we've got uh, the elements are totally unchanged. I didn't touch the HTML, but they're now in a line here. In addition, there is a black line between each one of these links, each anchor tag here. Now the way this is done is actually a little bit tricky. I mean, I'll tell you now, it's a border, but what's tricky about it is that uh, this one does not have that border, right? Or if you were doing it the other way, if you were doing the left side, left, 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 left there is no left side border for home so you have to use a little bit of a, a fancy css selector to say apply it to all of them and then oh wait on the last one no border or on the first one no border that's all i'll say about it you can look at the solution um, but i did mention this one has some slightly more challenging pieces
then this is pretty much untouched we've got our three images who are drastically resized you can just pick a size I think I did 300 by 200 and then don't worry about the colors here but we've got what looks to be two borders or a border and something else hint hint there's only one border that you can set on any element uh, and it is not a box shadow I have not talked about box shadow if you're following this course so it is done using the properties that I specified in CSS or in the CSS comment these are the only properties I used so uh, yeah if you didn't watch the entire video you may need to go back and see how to do this uh, a couple things I'll mention don't worry about the hover effect if you'd like to put that in there by all means uh, and then there is some spacing between them okay and then lastly we have the form which is pretty drastically different as well we end up with a form where we have each input on its own line and a button that takes up the entire bottom line it also has a different background color um, so the form itself just tell you this now the form itself is the wide thing and then each one of these elements inside the form is taking up the entire length or rather the entire width of that form so you'll need to set the width on the form the container itself and then work on each input and the button also uh, this little line at the top that thick line is not on the input itself it's on the form all right also there's a bit of spacing don't forget that in between but don't go crazy worrying about the specific numbers the details of how many pixels or whatever just try and generally recreate this you can always look at the solution but you'll definitely get the most out of this if you attempt it on your own and and do it like uh, my students in person would do it or we ask them to complete it on their own or do the best they can and then we discuss it in the morning the next day so that's pretty much it pretty long video we covered a lot some very essential pieces of CSS border padding margin those are absolutely crucial to pretty much anything you'll do in CSS and then we have box sizing border clipping not as crucial but can be kind of fun and it can be very useful in certain situations and then we learned a little bit about the display property at least some of the most common values block inline and inline block specifically how they interact with the box model so Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it or at least got something out of this video. Try the assignment. Leave some comments, only if they're extremely nurturing and kind and loving. And please consider sharing the series or this video with anyone you know. Um, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Have a great day. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Stay sane. And uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you.